Hey folks, welcome to CFO Chat. As always, your front row seat with the Chief Finance Officer. Anytime a corporate action happens, you have all the detail and lowdown here. BAT Kenya released their numbers yesterday. We're delighted as always to sit down with Philemon Haribusana. Thank you very, very much, uh, Julian, and it's a pleasure to have this conversation with you today. The dividend. I think a lot of us appreciated last year was a very tough year for businesses, yep. but we didn't anticipate a double-digit decline on the dividend. And I know you'll give us the sweetener of the payout ratio is up yeah. by a good margin, yeah. but I'm not sure the market perceives it that way. We tend to focus more on the nominal figure. Good. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Julian. And I think um, I'm, I'm glad that you have started off with the dividend, which is actually one of the key highlights for our financial performance this year. When you look at the, our dividend policy over time, um, we, ha we aim to, play, to uh, pay about 65%. However, consistently, over the last four or five years, we have been at upwards of 80%. Correct. This year, we've made the choice to increase that to 90%, cognizant of the tough environment and the uh, decline in profitability. However, it's keeping in our commitment to make sure that we deliver strong shareholder returns uh, in the long term. Yeah. So uh, I look at the dividend more as reflecting the fundamentals of the business, and one of the key things is our ability to generate cash. If you look at the set of results that we have released, you'll see that our net cash from operations has stayed the same as the previous year, despite the decline in profitability, yeah. which is then enabling us to increase that dividend payout ratio. So I believe our shareholders will be more than pleased. <laughs> a dividend a yield of about 12% in the current environment is a pretty, pretty good performance. But Philemon, the counter narrative to what you're saying is that uh, when we market watchers look at BAT, yeah. many times we used to say that uh, if you look at BAT's dividend yield, it almost plays in the league of an IFB, like the one we saw yesterday. Yeah. In the present environment, at 12%, the IFB is playing at 18%. I know it's not apples for apples, but yeah. unfortunately, that's a benchmark we normally use. I'm glad you've brought up uh, the IFB. And if you look at um, the economic turbulence, that has happened last year, which is largely what has impacted the interest rates and um, as a result of the currency devaluation and the pressures that we have been having generally from a macro and economic perspective, yeah. the dividend yield of 18% from an uh, IFB perspective, I think, from my view, is not sustainable. So it's a short-term hiccup, uh, which I don't think should be used to judge the long-term uh, performance or the long-term uh, return yeah. from an investment perspective. We can look at it as a correction here, for, uh, if you may, uh, because I expect that that uh, yield from an IFB perspective will come down. I think the expectation was that it would be above 20%, yeah. and we have seen that it is at, at 18%. So longer term, I think we are still a pretty good stock. All right. Interesting perspective there. When I was coming through your numbers, I thought Finance Act 2023 gave you guys some good breather, at least yep. for the first time in a long time. Yep. We didn't see some uh, proposals around excise on your products. But when I look at your performance yesterday, it looks like you have some carryovers from Finance Act 22. Yep. Maybe you can give us more context around that. Thanks. Uh, while last year we didn't get specific changes of excise on uh, cigarettes, you have to remember that in 2022 we had two excise increases. Yep. The first one was in July at 10%. And then in October, a 6% inflationary adjustment. Yeah. The lag effect of this meant that the full year financials for 2023, we had to reflect the increase of more than 16% into the financials. Yeah. So the full year impact is what has actually driven uh, the profitability. If you look at the key highlights for our financials, tax, uh, excise tax and total taxes have increased by 5%. By 5%. Yeah. So in totality, that's really the main driver of the, uh, of, of the performance. But having said that, I think from uh, the no excise perspective, I think that is sustainable in the long term. Yeah. What we are focusing on now is a reflection of the fact that when you don't take excise shocks, then it helps the industry to recover and actually there's more money uh, to be made from the fiscals. Yeah. Uh, the increase of 5%, despite the decline <coughs> from an industry perspective, is a pretty good story. And what we need to watch out, uh, I think, from a medium-term strategy perspective and from an exercise strategy perspective going into 24 uh, uh, budget cycle, is to make sure that we continue giving the industry the opportunity uh, to be able to solidify and to be able to weather out the impacts or the unintended consequence of past excise increases, which have been significant. 
Right, okay. I'll be coming back to the regulatory environment a little later. Yeah. But for now, when I strip out your numbers mm. and decouple H1 from H2, yeah. it looks like whereas H1 was down marginally, the proper heat came in the second half. And I'm yeah. curious as to what exactly happened in H2 because when I was doing my math, that is where the double digit decline actually comes from. Yeah. So two things, two key things, um, uh, Julians. The first one is H1 last year, uh, from a working capital cycle perspective, we front load uh, a lot of our input costs. Yeah. Yeah. So the impact of the increase in costs was felt more in half two. That's the first one. Right. Uh, the second one is we had some volume phasings across our uh, export markets which were more uh, in H H1 than in H2. And specifically, uh, there were some regulatory changes in key markets uh, around the block. We supply about 15 markets. And as a result of that, we were required to be able to front load some of the volume uh, in H1 to ensure that they are able to comply with some regulatory changes. So annualized, the, the phasing impact, but when you look at an annualized perspective, I think it's a pretty balanced uh, uh, view. However, the lag effect of working capital cycles meant that H2 had higher uh, costs yeah. uh, and, the, uh, and, and the differential between the volume phasing. I think the third uh, and more important is, though there was no specific change on excise tax, there were certain changes introduced in the Finance Act, yeah. specifically on some of the imported uh, materials, <coughs> yes. which either the, the rate changed or there were new rates which were introduced, like yeah. hinge lead packs, which were felt in H2. So when I compare H1 and H2, it was like there were two different seasons. Yeah. However, from a total perspective, I think it's a pretty good and resilient performance uh, I see. overall. So when you look at the quality of your earnings by and large, um, the top line is down 2%. Yep. The heat coming from indirect taxes is yep. up. Your costs are up. How do you salvage your margins? If you look at uh, the performance, and, and as you have rightfully mentioned, uh, top line was marginally down around 2%. Uh, the benefits, despite the declines in volume, the benefits of uh, FX supported uh, uh, the, the revenue from yeah. that perspective. But also you have to recall that largely our, our, our business is split into two, the export business and the domestic business. Exports is around 48% of the revenue, which helps cushion against any shocks that we have from a domestic perspective. But coming back to the uh, cost base, you will see that our cost base was largely flat, yeah. despite yeah. all the input cost inflation that we have done. Mm -hmm. So we do a pretty good job at managing the cost base. What we did last year is implemented a couple of productivity initiatives, yeah, in terms of, for example, uh, investing more in, in solar, uh, investing more in local leaf versus imported leaf, to just make sure that we contain the cost base. So if you look at the underlying fundamentals, the cost is not increasing as high as the inflation is increasing, okay. which is a testament to our strategy to manage the cost base. Because there are only two ways of protecting earnings. One is you increase the revenue. Uh, where there is a knock, then you support it with making sure that the cost base is sustainable, mm -hmm. which is what we have done. So if you could uh, paint for us a picture, how have you recalibrated this question of local versus external leaf? So, uh, Currently, uh, if, if I get to go to 2022, we used to use around 50-50. 50% of the leaf is locally produced uh, because uh, we have farmers who we support to, to grow the leaf. And what we did is we've ramped up the production of the leaf to increase that our target is by close to this, uh, by close of this year, will be upwards around 60%. Yeah. And it's something that we continuously invest in to make sure that we are able then to benefit, uh, number one, uh, support our farmers, get more money in their pockets, but number two also, try to shield ourselves from external shocks of imported inflation. So over time, we want to grow this to about 70%. Uh, it will never be 100% because of the blend recipes that we need, yeah. uh, but uh, where we can control, we are trying to cause that to go upwards. You have to remember that being a tobacco, the tobacco being an agricultural crop, uh, then the benefits of the investments, for example, that you did last year, will only be, uh, be felt this year. I see. Yeah. BAT is one of the businesses which I would argue that uh, <clears throat> in the present FX headwinds yeah. has almost a natural hedge because of the volume of exports you put out. Yeah. One, uh, to what extent did that play out in the numbers we have seen? Mm. But curiously now, we have seen the shilling is receding 
uh, and, and really clawing back significantly. Mm. Do you see an erosion of the gains you have enjoyed so far? I don't see uh, an erosion significantly because you, you, as, as you uh, see, the, the biggest challenge is usually a very sharp uh, either depreciation of the shilling. And it affects us in, uh, in two ways. On the top line, yes, we benefit, but also we have dollar-denominated uh, working capital requirements, yeah. which then mean that uh, the, the, the impact of that is more than offset, uh, which is a natural hedge, as you have said. However, also from a uh, strategy perspective, because we have significant generation of dollars, which is upward of $120 million annually, then we are able to hedge and we are able to uh, make sure that we put in place measures to make sure that our rate is stable uh, throughout the year. Yeah. So the benefit, the, the fact that we have dollar generation gives us more leverage to be able to have a predictable ex exchange rate over time. And when we plan, we don't uh, consider, we strip out external shocks yeah. and make sure that the internally generated uh, funds help us protect against uh, the devaluation from a cost-based perspective. So I would say, uh, I think the correction, what you're mentioning about the, the, the yesterday, is still up in the air. I think uh, one day does not make a trend. Uh, so we, just, we, we, we need to make sure that uh, we see how that plays out. But having said that, if you see, uh, last year we started at 120, we closed at higher. So which is, if you see like for like, really the depreciation was more towards the end of the year. So even if you correct, the full impact of the depreciation was not really in the full year numbers for 2023. Yeah. So even if it appreciates <coughs> a bit, uh, I don't see a significant impact there. Philemon, as someone who has covered BAT for a while, I thought yesterday's numbers were unusually muted about the volume game. Yes. We had no context and color around it. Yeah. So uh, how did the volumes play out in 23? Yeah, volumes were softer uh, by four to five percent, uh, both in domestic and export markets. Uh, in the domestic markets, I think, as I said, it is the lag effect of the excise increases, which then um, meant that we had to change prices. Uh, but you have to remember that because of the portfolio uh, diversification that we have, having uh, brands across different layers of the portfolio, then it allows us to have flexibility in when we pass on and how much we pass on from a domestic perspective. So the domestic perspective, around 4 to 5%. From an export perspective, we have a balance, which is actually one of the good uh, uh, stories. Some of our markets uh, experienced uh, disruptions. I think yeah. there were geopolitical um, tensions and, and impacts, especially in the Horn of Africa. But they were more than compensated by some of our other key markets, including the DRC. So when I look at the balance, I think from a volume perspective, we have a good balance of mix. And it is still within uh, the globally accepted guideline uh, of around 2 to 5% from a decline perspective. But having said that, that is from a combustibles perspective. Yeah. Yeah. From a longer term strategic perspective, we also, uh, you will recall that we've invested uh, heavily and significantly in our modern oral uh, nicotine pouches, which is then also a new business stream uh, which helps on the long term yeah. balance out the performance across uh, both the cigarettes, which is the combustible side, and the non-combustible sites going forward. Philemon, you have really touched on the regulatory environment, and I'd like us now to take a, a bite into that side. The first is uh, one of the changes that came about with the final Act of 23 was around remittance of withholding within five days. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious as to how you are navigating that provision in terms of uh, streamlining yeah. your compliance. So from a, a tax landscape perspective, I think uh, the changes that came, uh, obviously being a dynamic business, we've invested, uh, we've reviewed our processes to see the frequency uh, uh, with which we capture our transactions yeah. to make sure that we give ourselves ample time uh, for and still comply with the regulations. So when I see uh, previous year versus now, we now have uh, almost bi-weekly uh, cycles with which we process our transactions, which helps us then uh, navigate and be able to comply. It's not a very big concern uh, uh, for us. Uh, I think the key items from a compliance perspective is to ensure that we are able to uh, use technology uh, to be able to support uh, compliance from a tax perspective. Uh, we, we are a big uh, tax contributor. 
uh, from both from an excise and, and a VAT perspective yeah. and other taxes like, uh, for example, tax stamps. Uh, and we have had very good uh, levels of compliance uh, and, and very good relationships with the revenue authority. So it's not a very big uh, concern. Yes, it is a change, but we adapt uh, from a resourcing perspective and from a work processes perspective to ensure that we comply. Fantastic. Excise. When you read the medium-term revenue strategy, there's a proposal, first of all, to adopt what is being called an optimal excise rate yeah. for tobacco products. In what shape and form would this come for you to be optimal for your business? Yeah. I think currently uh, that's still um, in, in consultation uh, stage. Uh, it's not very clear what optimal is. Uh, but you have to look at excise in the context, uh, number one, of the tax differentials between neighboring countries. Yeah. Yeah? Kenya currently, the excise tax on cigarettes, for instance, is more than double all that of neighbor, neighboring countries. Yeah. So when we talk about optimal tax, then my view would be is optimal should be lower to try and reduce uh, that differential. Yeah. And when you do that, then you stem the growth in illicit trade. There's a very uh, key and important correlation between the levels of uh, excise and uh, the illicit trade incidents yeah. in some of these countries. So when I look at Kenya, for example, currently the levels of illicit trade is about 27 percent, yeah, which causes, uh, from our estimates, the government to lose close to seven billion shillings annually. Yeah. So if we were to to reduce, for example, illicit trade by half, that's almost uh, four or five billion shillings, yeah. which is better uh, and it is a more sustainable approach than excise hikes. So from an optimal tax perspective, my view would be optimal is probably lower, considering the differentials of taxes, uh, especially within the region. And also, you have to take <coughs> into account the unintended consequence of excise hikes. Yeah. If you increase um, excise, we have to pass it on to the consumer, which increases prices and drives down legitimate uh, consumption into illicit products. Mm -hmm. yeah. Considering what um, listening to you sounds like uh, regulatory overreach, have you ever considered, uh, given the sort of footprint you have in markets outside Kenya, to cut your exposure in Kenya? And I know you're a manufacturer, and of course you'll say you have plants here and what have you, but already you have a good footprint outside, mm -hmm. so that at least you address this issue of the tax impact. Because if you look at the tax impact on your earnings, it's not small. It is massive. I, I think first, the, the first uh, comment I would make there is Kenya remains our hub uh, for several reasons. And Kenya, we are here for the long haul. Yeah. <laughs> Kenya, for the avoidance of doubt. For the avoidance of doubt. <laughs> yeah, we are here for the long haul. Kenya, uh, there are several things which go for us. One is we've enjoyed relative uh, stability from a fiscal and regulatory perspective uh, in the recent past. Uh, the second one is we have very good uh, skill set. Yeah. We have a very good uh, talent workforce. Uh, recently, last year, the operations for BAT was reorganized. Correct. And now Kenya is the headquarters for Eastern Southern Africa, an addition of five markets in the southern part of Africa, which is a testament of BAT's intention to anchor Kenya as a hub for the region. So from a, uh, from a perspective of diversification, I think there is no intent in the short term or in the long term to change from that. Okay. Yeah. The second aspect is you'll see the kind of investments uh, that we have made in Kenya. From a modern oral perspective, Kenya is the one of five uh, countries in the world which has a modern oral uh, factory, yeah. Yeah, which we started investing in in 2020, which also demonstrates the confidence that we have in having Kenya as our regional manufacturing hub. Uh, and with this, actually from a country perspective, uh, speaking as a Kenyan, the first one is the export earnings, which I've talked about, mm. which is sustained and has been sustained over time, and we look to grow that. The second is, man, uh, is employment opportunities that we give to our people, which I think is a very good uh, story, and we need to protect that. To enable that for the long term, I think we need to make sure that uh, we have certainty from a regulatory perspective, and we have uh, balance and evidence based, for example, fiscal framework and regulatory framework, which then allows us to sweat that investment and achieve that gains from a collective perspective. Mm -hmm. So the investments that we are making, both from farmers, from the factory, from the people, and some of the changes that we did in, in 2023, I think more than 
um, uh, uh, buttresses the point that we are here to stay. I see, I see. We need to close this conversation. Um, everyone I'm speaking to in this earning cycle is uh, cutting back or holding out on, on CapEx because of uncertainties in the environment. What's your outlook like at least in 2024? We continue from a BAT, our strategy has always been, and you know, uh, we are not very CapEx heavy. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the significant investments that we made uh, over the last three, four, five, uh, three years is the investment in the modern oral plant. Yeah. Uh, the capacity that we have installed uh, currently from a cigarette manufacturing perspective is more than optimal. We are about 70% utilization, which means that we don't need any more, even if we were to get additional volume from exports, we don't need to increase the investment. So the CAPEX requirements uh, in 2024 will be more geared about protecting the assets, making sure that um, uh, we continue to sweat them from an efficiency perspective uh, rather than from a replacement perspective. So I don't see any big bill. It is not going to be a change versus what we have done in the past. Yeah. Uh, it's more uh, in the ranges of around half a billion shillings, which is part of the ongoing plans that we usually have. So no significant requirement for in, uh, investments in the short term. And actually, that is one of the points why we have increased the payout uh, ratio from a yeah. dividend perspective, yeah. because then we don't see any large capital uh, requirements in the medium term. Yeah. And, and, and secondly, also, if you'll see from our cash generation, we also always aim uh, to convert 100% of the profit that we make in, into cash, which we have successfully done in this year, despite the fact that the profitability was yeah. lower. So if you look at my net cash from operations compared to 2022, it's uh, at par, yeah. despite the decline in earnings. <laughs> right, and uh, now to close it. I was going back and I think the last decline we saw in net earnings for BAT was in uh, F19, yeah. down by about 4%. Right now we're looking at double digits, close to 19%. Mm -hmm. um, was 2023 a one-off? Yes, I think uh, 2023 is a one-off, especially considering uh, the macro environment. If you look at the economic turbulence that we have had and the impact on the various countries, both from an import, uh, domestic and export perspective, I think now uh, I would say 2023 becomes a base. Because then, uh, remember, there's also usually, from an economic perspective, the lag impacts of COVID uh, and some of the uh, geopolitical tensions in the world and the impact that has uh, on, for example, imported uh, input costs. Uh, I believe that 2023 uh, then was exacerbated by the turbulence. Uh, and then that meant that from a business performance perspective, and you would have seen uh, actually across the NSE that there is significant uh, pressures uh, across the companies. Uh, from a BAT perspective, I think the fact that uh, the profitability declined, we still made over a billion shillings uh, in, in profit before tax. Yes. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, we're still uh, increasing the dividend payout ratio, and we are going to pay a healthy dividend of 50 shillings. In the current <laughs> environment, a dividend of 50 shillings, I think, is, is something to, to smile about, especially from a shareholder perspective. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure my shareholders will be looking forward to June uh, to enjoy uh, the, the, the proposed final dividend of 45 shillings. Final question. Going back to the MTRS, one of the proposals inside there around excise on tobacco products is that excise should be able to address the negative externalities. I'm actually lifting the words from there uh, that are precipitated by the products. And when you read this, does it concern you? Does it dim your outlook for the business? Uh, not quite. I think, uh, number one, um, just to also paint some color. Remember, uh, in Kenya, from a domestic perspective, we have what we call solesham levy. Yeah? Uh, solesham uh, levy is int intended to address exactly that, uh, which is 2% of the net revenue of the products that you uh, that are consumed in Kenya. So there is already a mechanism for that. And I don't believe that excise is the right um, uh, place to be because we already have the solution. Yeah. Now, from an excise perspective, addressing externalities, we have to be careful uh, to get a balance, not to cause unintended consequence. As I said, the market now, one in every four cigarettes uh, is illicit. illicit. Now, if you put pressure then what you, are, uh, what you end up doing is moving uh, the other 70% into uh, illicit, illicit pool, yeah. which, is not, uh, which 
means two things. One, from the uh, revenue authorities, you get lower revenue. And from the industry volumes, uh, it goes down and it makes you unsustainable in the long term. So I don't think uh, aggressive uh, excise uh, is the way to go. I think actually, uh, uh, when we say optimal, and as I've said earlier, optimal for me means lower, considering the disparities between excise. I think that is where we should be leaning towards.